So yeah, I have been asked to speak to you about um, GHB and in the context of the experience in the emergency department, that's where my main expertise lies. So as a bit of background, GHB is an endogenous neurotransmitter. We all have GHB in our brains. Uh, it's in the brains of various animals as well and is in fact present in small quantities in uh, meat that people may choose to eat and even in wine. There are GHB receptors in the central nervous system of humans, so um, that's where they act. But in overdose, they mainly seem to exert their effects via GABA B receptors. In general, it's a, a central nervous system depressant, uh, depressant and it's been used um, medically for those uh, for that it's that for that effect over. Uh, several years. It was first developed by Russian chemist Alexander Zaitsev in 1874 and was in fact initially marketed as a health food supplement. People would take it to assist with sleep and it's um, still used in the bodybuilding industry. It does have growth hormone releasing properties and is quite common to um, be used in people looking to increase their muscle mass. There are a number of therapeutic uses. Uh, it's mainly used as an anaesthetic, uh, still used in some areas of Europe, although it seems to be much better in children in inducing uh, decent anaesthesia. And in adults, you definitely have to add um, other anaesthetics. It has no um, analgesic properties at all. It's used in obstetrics uh, in Europe as well. It's actually a very good cervical dilator. Um, and uh, in fact, it uh, um, is used in narcolepsy as well in the US and in Europe. Um, there's a product, uh, you can see it at the top of the slide there called Xyrum, and you can actually buy a pure GHB if it's prescribed. It's also used, as was mentioned earlier today, potentially for opioid or alcohol withdrawal. And uh, I wasn't aware of its uh, use in uh, narcolepsy, but it seems even in uh, pop culture, um, the Simpsons are, are, are aware of these things if, uh, if no one else is. Nice. Phil, you've got amphetamines, anticataplectics, and GHB, also known as Georgia Homeboy or Liquid Ecstasy. Do not take these with alcohol. What if I've already been drinking and I don't plan to stop? Are you asking me out? I mean, you're not, but it seems like you'd be fun to hang with, and I'm pretty fascinated myself. I'm an author. I thought you worked in a drugstore. <laughs> I thought that was particularly funny. Uh, so it first started uh, being used uh, illicitly in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and really um, it was the early 2000s where um, colleagues of mine at St Vincent's noticed uh, this uh, upswing in this uh, potentially novel drug and started doing some research in the area. There's a couple of precursor chemi chemicals, 1,4-butanodiol and um, uh, gamma-butyrolactone, that when taken orally are converted uh, within the body to GHB and in fact work in exactly the same way. They just converted to uh, pure GHB. And all of those substances, they are colourless, odourless, but slightly bitter tasting uh, liquids. So th there is a bit of a, a history of uh, these substances being used in drug assisted sexual assault. Um, and obviously, being colourless and odourless helps, but there is that, that, that subtle taste. So if you added it to water, you might um, see that there is uh, a, a slightly bitter or salty taste and you know why do people use it it's, it's, again it's it's very cheap um, uh, ten dollars a dose that's that's cheaper than a lot of other psychoactive substances that people may choose to use um, again, I'm also in the emerging threat segment of today, and really um, uh, only about 0.1% of young people in the most recent survey uh, in Australia um, had used GHB within the previous year, and deaths are very rare, but as we'll come to see, they, they're certainly not um, unheard of. And something that I remember, you know, seeing bodybuilders in the emergency department telling me that they were taking GHB every day, and that nothing I could say could stop them, and that it was only when medical people got involved that that there was um, any potential harm and that it was completely safe, but we'll see that that's not quite the case. One more little video to see why, why do people take GHB? Don't you want to finish your drink? Yeah, you're the pharmacy.
that is very much what like the patients appear at four o'clock in the morning on a on a Sunday morning in the emergency department. So the effects that uh, Homer quite eloquently uh, showed us there, you know, it induces a state of euphoria. There is some sedation. It can induce sleep, and hence it's used in uh, cataplexy and narc narcolepsy. Uh, it's got quite strong aphrodisiac properties. Um, patients often tell us that uh, they use it in that context. Uh, there's this enhanced sensuality and uh, emotional warmth that obviously people quite enjoy. And I mentioned the growth hormone releasing properties. But despite the, the, the symptoms, they got one thing wrong. It's not not really hallucinogenic in any way. One thing quite novel about GHB is that it's got such a narrow therapeutic index. The uh, amount taken to have a you know, good time for the desired effect is about one gram, and to induce you know, coma might just be four or five grams. So there's a very narrow therapeutic index, and when people are taking things in very small things, in a, you know, a few drops of a liquid, a few extra drops it goes a long way, and uh, people overshoot the mark quite commonly. So it's pharmacokinetics, there's rapid absorption, um, it's rapidly metabolised, that's mainly in the liver, um, and the usual dose is between one to three grams to achieve the desired effect, and it can only be detected in serum for about eight hours and in urine for about 12 hours. So this makes it particularly problematic when there's um, uh, an allegation of a drug-assisted sexual assault where people commonly don't uh, come to medical or, or forensic help until a lot later than that. And I've already mentioned that GBL and 1,4-butanodiol are endogenously converted to GHB, um, usually via peripheral lactinases and alcohol and aldehyde dehydrogenase, respectively. So who's using GHB? Who do we see in the emergency department? It's uh, definitely a part of the rave culture, the, the, the party scene, um, certainly um, at party, the, the party scene in um, men who have sex with men. The, it's used, still used as a bodybuilder supplement, as a sleep aid, um, and there is this history of drug-assisted sexual assault as well. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around in the city and seen little um, soy sauce containers scattered outside nightclubs, and that's the most common way of, uh, uh, of purchasing GHB. It's usually in those little soy sauce containers, and that's about one dose. It's got a number of different names. So in the emergency department, we get very used to uh, all the different names. It's commonly uh, referred to as G, but you heard it uh, called by a homeless pharmacist, the Georgia homeboy. That's a bit more of a, a US saying, but there's many different names, goop, liquid ecstasy, fantasy. These are all the names you might see in the, in the lay media as well. There were a number of products, including Blue Nitro and others, that were sold at smart shops and, and sex shops as um, legal high and some of those products were, were pure GHB. What's the classical syndrome we see in the emergency department? The most common thing we see is coma. Uh, the patient uh, usually arrives um, really quite comatose, profoundly comatose. A GCS of three would probably be you know, the median GCS, and that's as, as essentially as comatose as you can be. But to the user, they just call this geeing out. And uh, um, if you look at these drug forums that, that people have um, spoken about today, you know, they'll tell you, oh, you can just sleep it off and we'll see how, you know, that might not necessarily be the best thing that you can do. There's some mild res respiratory depression, some mild hypotension. Patients do come in vomiting. That's obviously a problem in someone who's profoundly comatose. And one of the classical features in how we identify in the emergency department is there seems to be a rapid cycling between being profoundly comatose and then we give them quite a painful stimulus and they can wake up briefly for a short time only to, to become comatose again. And uh, they might do that you know, several times during their uh, stay in the emergency department. And when they're waking up, they can be quite agitated before they sort of come to their senses. And, uh, you know, it's not terribly uncommon for us to have to um, physically or chemically restrain these patients. But the classical syndrome, it's actually very short-lived. There's not many other drugs that uh, you present to the emergency department where, with good supportive care within an hour or two, the vast majority of patients are actually fine. And we'll have a look at what the, the literature tells us about that. So we've got a bit of a, a motto in the emergency department, everything in ED, if you're a clinician, you know it's the a ABCs and it's A, B, C, D, E, could this be G? So airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, and could this be G? So I've already alluded to the clinical course. Um, there's this rapid onset of central nervous system and respiratory depression. Uh, so someone's at a party, enjoying themselves, euphoria, followed by coma. Um, 
patients usually arrive in the emergency department the sickest they're going to be. They've, it's you, because of its short half-life, they take too much and the ambulance is called, they arrive profoundly comatose. If, if there's a history of what's happened, we know we can just do good supportive care, good nursing care, we don't need to do much else. Um, we, we know the times of day that these guys come in and, and the venues that they come in from, but it's commonly also mixed with alcohol or other CNS depressants and that can cloud the picture um, some of the time. Um, if someone is still very sleepy after five or six hours, it's really time for us to, to consider an, an alternative diagnosis. In the days when we used to intubate these patients, it was very common to, during the intubation process or shortly after, for the patient to self-extubate. That stimulus was enough to wake them up. There's been a number of mass overdose um, uh, ex experiences, a number of parties, including Earth Corps and Two Tribes. There's been many others where, depending on the potency of the GHB or just its availability, there's been a number of overdoses and uh, local uh, emergency services have been overwhelmed. <coughs> 